Good morning, everyone. First of all, like I mentioned before, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It, feels, it literally feels like we have, we've been gone for like ages and I know it's only, we missed one weekend. Um, but we sincerely missed you guys, we enjoyed our last weekend and we'll give a bit more feedback next week about how they treated us, what they taught us and, and just the reason why we went away last weekend. Um, the reason I don't want to share it now, although I can, otherwise you're going to hear the repeat next week. Um, because I know a large part of the congregation, a large part of the ladies have um, are actually gone to the um, Equip conference in Queenstown and we're very thankful for it because despite the fact that we don't think that everything should be surrounded about this conference or this conference or this conference, we also can't deny that when we have these focused weekends on just infilling and equipping and, and just spiritual growth, there is something special to it. And we're very thankful for the opportunity that they were able to go. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity of all of you being here this morning. Now, to be completely honest, like I mentioned before, as I was thinking about the women's conference and who's going to be left here, I kept on, for some reason, I had this idea in my head that we were going to be a few people. I don't know why, because I just know, I think we were all surprised by the large group that actually went to the conference. So in my head, I thought that not so many would be here. And yet, as I started planning and thinking, okay, God, what we're going to do, we're going to do like a, a, like a social thing for everybody to connect because there's reason and purpose for that as well. And then the more I started preparing for that, I just really, I felt uneasy if I can put it that way. And then one night while I was still in bed, I just sort of had this, it sounds a lot more spiritual than it is. I just want to clarify that. But I was lying in, in bed and I just had the scripture come to mind and it just kept on staying there. And then I realized, but this lays the foundation so much more for today. And regardless of how many people come, whether it's 10 or, or one or a hundred, this is the message that I feel God wants for us today. And seeing all of you here, I'm very thankful that I was not so hard-headed as I usually am. Because this morning we're talking about something that I find very encouraging. And it's, it sort of goes on from the backdrop of upgrades. Now, who here has ever had an upgrade, whether it is your phone or your car or your spouse? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, but where I'm coming away from this is because especially if we talk about cell phones, for example. You get a new cell phone, in the past you were very excited, you would spend a whole night or two days with it, you'd copy your numbers from there to there, and, and you know, you, you'd make dedicated time to, to equip this upgrade so that you can let go of the old phone. But I don't know if I'm the only one, but now when you get a new phone or something, you sort of keep the old one so that you can have a backup, so that you can have those numbers because you're going to realize that not all the numbers copied, and then you need to go back to this one. So there's this constant moving forward but still holding on to the past. Some people get a new car or a second-hand new car and then they hold the old one so that they can move with it or they can do certain things with it. And this makes life sometimes difficult. And there's something that I feel why I mentioned the spouses is because I feel this is the perfect example when you go from going engaged and getting married specifically. There's no holding back on your past. We all know that that's wrong. That's just, it doesn't make sense. You can't justify, no, but maybe I need this old number or something. That's not something that we can do. And the reason I mention this is because if we look at, for example, um, African traditions, many of us have complained or wondered, you know, you see these, the, these African Christians in their culture, they, they, they proclaim Christianity full on, but yet at the same time, they hold on to ancestor worship. And, and this is a sad reality in, in the sense. And I read a book once by one of my university lectures, and, and his name is, his name is um, Robert Falkner, and he's been living up in Africa for I don't know how many years, and he came to the final conclusion, which sort of just made the light go up in my head. He made the argument of when they were first evangelized, when they were first told about Christ, they accepted it, they loved it, but never were they told to let go of the past because they don't see them as interchangeable things. They see this as God, but yet I, I respect my elders. There's a difference where his argument was, you need to tell them about Jesus, but then also follow through with saying like, Jesus is your ultimate ancestor because we all do come from Adam and Eve. And we need to have that type of argument. And it's very easy for us to look at other people and say, yes, but you've got two phones, you've got two cars, and you're holding on to the past. Or even to other cultures and say, yes, but you're holding on to your ancestor worship, or you're doing this or that. But yet I think very often we do the same things in our own life. 
We become a Christian, we're very excited, life is good, but yet we hold on to some of our old default positions. We hold on to our different type of world views, regardless of what the Bible says. Now we're trying to justify what the Bible says through what I already believed. And the thing is, this is sometimes difficult because very often the things that we do, we do in default because we don't know any better. No one ever told us, or even when we read something, we read it through the lens of our preconceived ideas. Now, why am I getting at this? Why, why is this such a major focus? Well, number one, I thought it would be a good idea for us to do you know, a book specifically with supposedly was supposed to be more men here at this service, so I thought about Hebrews, Hebrews coffee. I'm just kidding. This is a b- bad joke. I'm sorry. It's, I haven't gotten lots of sleep. But with that being said, before I put the scripture on the screen, we are going through the book of, scripture, uh, the book of Hebrews. Now, what I find interesting about the book of Hebrews is a very interesting book because it's, some people argue like who wrote it and who didn't write it and who was it written for and all these things. And, and that's sort of, it, it, it's, it's a solid argument and everyone has their different views. But for me, the most important thing is if you look at what the book says and what it's trying to highlight, I feel that it lays specifically into our foundation. Now, the book of Hebrews was written to a bunch of Hebrews. There we go. So you get five points for that one. <laughs> so, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jews, a, a, a group of Hebrews in, in origin, but yet now they are Christian. But now, you, you sort of need to understand, their whole life, their whole identity was built on this thing that every time I do something, it had to be followed through with a ritual. You know, I either had to kill this, or, or offer this, or I need to cleanse this, or don't do this, or don't do this. This is, this is all that they've known their entire lives, and now they've they're coming to Christianity with this expectation from the old Jewish past that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom, his his earthly kingdom, and and just rule constantly. That's that's the expectation that they had. That's what the Jews in general believe. They believe the Old Testament, which is essentially God creating everything, promising a Messiah to save us. And then a final part of that is this new king who will set up his kingdom. So this is why the Jews were very often confused with Jesus, because he came, but he first came to save, and then he will come to set up his kingdom. And both of these are taught in the Old Testament. So now, now you've got this group of Jews who, okay, I'm a Christian, and I can let go of all my traditions to to a very large extent, because that's what it means. And now, Jesus, okay, come. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but he hasn't come yet since they started believing it till now. So you can sort of understand the the impatience and their misunderstanding of what's going on because they were expecting this king which they accepted as the ultimate messiah so now the book of hebrews writes into this because they didn't know what to do with their new life because slowly but surely they started heading back to the old traditions back to the old rituals and back to everything that they knew before christianity before they knew that jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of what they believed so the book of hebrews does this beautiful tapestry of just explaining that Jesus is the superior upgrade to everything that they held dear. He speaks about angels. He speaks about the law. He speaks about how Jesus fulfilled the law, how Jesus is the ultimate uh, Moses, the ultimate Aaron, and he's, he's also the ultimate sacrifice. Everything that they did was temporary, but what Jesus did was the full, complete solution. And that's what he's trying to get across. And then he ends this book with like these points just to try and encourage us with what do we do now? Because first he wanted them to let go. Because if they keep on going back, they're neglecting this one. You can't have a new spouse while you're catering with your old wife. You can't have the new phone and still try and do this as well. Because then you're you're not, you know, you're in between. Like choose. It's not that difficult. Choose. Select. Make the commitment that all of you are thinking. It's not that easy. I still need that number. (laughs) I know. The struggle's real. But this is what he was trying to get across to them, to try and get across to them that we need to move on. So the first thing he talks about is we need to gather together as Christians. That's a major focus for him. Then he moves on and he tells us that we need to persevere in our faith. We, know, we shouldn't just say, okay, Jesus, I'm coming. And then the moment hardship hits, that we say, no, God doesn't exist. Because that's very often what we do. Or we see pain and suffering in the world. We see sickness in the world. But how can a loving God do this? We need to trust. There are answers for all these things in the Bible, and that's not the focus for today. But his major focus was we need to persevere. We need to serve one another. And we need to sanctify our lives. Those four points is what he ended this book on. And it's such a beautiful tapestry. But what I feel for today's 
services and it ties into, like Sophia wrote on the board, when the cat's away, we bry. Uh, <laughs> there's purpose in that, what we do. So after he's covered all these things of how we don't need the law anymore because it, it's not disqualifying the law, it's not getting rid of it, but Jesus fulfilled it for us. When we don't need to go to the ancestors to go to God, we can go directly to God because that's what Jesus did. We go to him directly. But then he gets to this point here. In Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, and he says, Let us firmly hold to the, to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, meaning God is faithful. And let us consider how to spur one another to love and good works, which means we should encourage each other, do good, be good, and that's great. So that's what he's saying. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves. We need to gather. It's a biblical principle. We, we cannot let this go. We cannot forsake it. We can't forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. But let us exhort one another, especially as you say, as you see the day approaching. Capital D. He's speaking about the day of the Lord when he's coming back. That's what he's speaking. As we're anticipating the king to come back, we need to assemble together. Now, this morning is a special service, and it's a bit of a shorter service because there's a major point that we need to do or to understand, and then I want us to go and apply it. That's what I feel God laid on my heart. So the first thing that we need to see here is, he says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But what was the verse right before that, or the section? And let us consider how to spur one another to love and good works. Now, keep that in your mind. So we need to encourage each other for good works and to be good and encourage each other in the faith. Can we do this if our ideal, our concept of Christianity means reading the Bible by myself and going to church simulate so that we can just sort of get like a touch of worship just to sort of set the scene and then we get. Can we do that? No. It's not what the Bible speaks about. The Bible speaks about the body being united. This one carrying this load. This one carrying this load. This is what our purpose is. The writer of Hebrews encourages us that we should gather together because what happens when people study in isolation or when they're alone, we get torn and we start following our own heads. We need to be in the body where we can encourage each other. And if someone believes wrongfully, we can say, listen, this is what scripture believes. Let's encourage each other in truth. When someone's going through a rough time, let's stand together and hold them up. That's the whole principle. We are called to be united in our socialness, in our fellowship which is the reason why we're having a bride afterwards and why the major focus for today is for us to actually start connecting more. Now, with that being said, I also just want to encourage all of you that I'm not complaining about anyone because I'm very encouraged. This is something that we actually gave as a praise report when we traveled to PE about how people within the congregation so much more are stepping in for one another and helping there and asking how's it going there and saying how we can help. It's a beautiful thing and it's, it's, it's just growing naturally. It's not me saying, okay, listen, so this one needs this prayer. Okay, okay, you do that one. Okay, now you do. It's not that. It's, it's this natural thing that's just coming from within. And I'm encouraged by it, but sometimes we also need to see the legalistic side or the, or the biblical scripture support for it. The writer of Hebrews encourages us to gather together, to be together, because it's only when we're together that we can sort of sharpen each other. You can't teach patience if everything goes smoothly. We can't practice forgiveness if no one does ever, anything ever wrong to you. We need to understand that there's certain things that God is calling us in our search to be more like Him. And this is truly, this is my hopeful this morning. My hopeful this morning is that we understand that we need to be together. Because if we are together, we can grow in truth. Which is one of the reasons why also, for those of you who might not know, we usually go through books in the Bible, but for the next season, I'm not completely sure how long, but I just feel God says, let's pause just for a moment and look at this new season, because we all need to be on the same page. We all need to strengthen each other and encourage each other so that we can make a difference in Bathurst. We can call people to God. Not to village church, to him, so that they can gather. If it's somewhere else, go for it. Our idea is never to fill this place. Our idea is to fill heaven. That's our major focus. But we can only do that if we rightfully believe. So as the chicken sort of sounds in the background, welcome to Bathurst. 
just really want to encourage all of us that let's take the time to encourage one another. Let's take the time to come a little bit early to say, listen, how's your week been? And let us get past weather talk. Let us get past doing this or doing that. Let's actually connect with each other. Phone each other. Invite us for a bride. Maybe not us, but other people without a two-year-old. I'm kidding. You can invite us. It's fine. But I think that's a major focus for us. We need to be able to laugh together so that we can cry together and so that we can celebrate together. That's what church is about. It's not about coming here, feeding on a word, and Jesus, you're okay, thank you, and then I go. And this is not a light topic. I made a few jokes here and there, some intentional, some not. But I firmly believe that that's God's heart for us. We're a family. God wants us to connect. God wants us to appreciate one another. It's not about me speaking at the front, which is why today's service is so short. God's church is about us connecting with each other and answering each other's questions. So if you do have any biblical questions or something that you would like us to discuss in the group, please write it on the back in, on those papers and put it in the givings box or send me a WhatsApp. Um, what we want to do, our intention is to put all these questions in a sort of structure that makes sense so that we can handle them one on top of the other. So if this one builds the foundation for this one, then we can cover these questions so that we can all be on the same page. And then after that, we will move on to the next season where we feel God lead it, leads us. But I want to say thank you so much for this morning. If you feel you only came for the message, I'm sorry, it's a short one. See it as a sample. But let's encourage each other. Let's live together. I'm going to light the fire after we're finished. Please stay. There's more than enough for everyone. And just have a wonderful day together. So let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to say thank you so much for this wonderful service. Thank you for us having the opportunity to gather together. Thank you for the opportunity that we know you, Lord, because we know without you, we, we can't accept you, Lord. We're sinful by nature. We're, we're, we're opposite to everything that you are, Lord, but yet you love us. Regardless of the fact that we still think about our past, we know that once we've accepted you, you've forgiven us, Lord. We know that church is truly about us gathering. It's not about the building or time frame. Lord, it's about what you want to do in our lives, Lord. And for that, we're thankful. I ask that you please go with everyone at the women's conference, lead them safely back home, and keep the momentum going for whatever you started in their hearts, Lord. Allow us to, to feel the presence and the change of what you, what you did in all, all your ladies, Lord. With that, we'd also like to say, please go with us, Lord. Help us to remember that church is about fellowship and about love and, and caring for one another, Lord so that we can let go of our past, so that we can move into this upgraded life, Lord, this upgraded life of mutual support and, and just vulnerability with one another and to you, Lord. I thank you for that. In your great and holy name, amen.